All right, we are live for another Mike and Mario show for this Friday afternoon. How are you doing, Mario? I'm doing well, and you, Mike? Doing wonderful. It's a bright and sunny day outside. Looking forward to an exciting weekend. Have a lot of festivities planned, so looking forward to getting a chance to hang out with family and friends. So excited to kick this off the right way. But there's a lot of things worth touching on, on in the news. We got uh, a lot of types of stories to dive off into. But before we do that, I want to welcome everybody to this live stream here. If you as you come in, hit that thumbs up button, show your support for the channel. And then also when we open up the phone lines or take questions from the uh, chat, make sure you have some good questions or thoughts to share with us. So uh, let's uh, want to kick this off. Just talking about the economic numbers that came out today. Yes, that's right. We had the U.S. non-farm payroll numbers. All right. And, so let me uh, pull up the screen here. All right, go ahead. Can you continue? Yeah. On the so uh, a lot of the headlines are noting that the U.S. created uh, 500 and uh, I think 59,000 jobs. <laughs> oh. Uh, and uh, but one thing that I learned uh, working in the markets and uh, what investors and uh, traders look at is the expectation. So mm -hmm. as you can see here, the expectation was 650,000. So it's worse than expected. Mm -hmm. The other interesting point that I would point out is that the hourly earnings here, average hourly earnings were expected yeah. at 0.2%. They came out at 0.5. That's really high. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you look at the mainstream reporting, they won't touch upon that. I think that shows that the economy is slower than people think mm -hmm. and costs are rising quicker than people think they uh, the mainstream economists will say oh average hourly earnings wages are creating inflation yeah. i would say it's the opposite inflation is seeping you know seeping into the labor market it's uh, making wages rise mm -hmm. uh, and, and there are reasons for that there's a lot of uh, people who are still not working there's a, a lot of businesses that haven't come back online and I think uh, all the stimulus checks mm -hmm. are discouraging people from going to work because they, they can get paid to stay at home. And it's yeah. the same thing here in the UK. So I, I don't think they're very good numbers. And yeah. we saw that gold and silver really uh, rebounded and mm -hmm. basically gained uh, back all the losses that we saw yesterday. Yeah. And overnight, gold uh, touched uh, 1855, and it's now almost back to 1900. So uh, to me, it shows that uh, investors are concerned about stagflation, really. So it's yeah. not a good good scenario. And the other things, thing I would say about these numbers, uh, people don't realize the uh, non-farm payroll is worked out through a survey. So mm -hmm. basically, they do a survey of companies, and, and then they extrapolate how many uh, people they hired in general. Uh, yeah. So it, it's not like uh, they go and count exactly yeah. so <laughs> the, these numbers can be highly doctored i would say as well maybe you maybe being in the us you could tell me uh how yeah that, you know so, how things are really going <laughs> and that's and that's why i as i mentioned before we went live i never paid much attention to these numbers because i don't trust them just because i, I don't believe that there's a way of accurately counting the amount of people it's, it's even not even counted anymore. Just the fact there's a large pool of people who are labeled as uh, no longer looking and they're not a part yeah. of the workforce. We never hear anything about that. So when you hear 400, 500,000 jobs, I'm thinking like, is that people who return to work, people who are, you know, are, are starting new jobs or, or what? It's because as of last March, everything was completely thrown off and I have what, over 20 million people in this country, supposedly yeah. either unemployed or not being paid enough. Then we have small business owners that are probably not to function as well. So I don't trust those numbers whatsoever. But I do know what I do see is that the uh, a lot of the uh, restaurant chains and whatnot, they have signs in front of their restaurants and they're offering sign up bonuses as well as an increase of pay. And even here in Michigan, our governor Whitmer is looking to allocate three billion dollars I saw towards small businesses to help incentivize people back to work. So they're saying that you can offer your 12, 13, 14, and we'll chip in. You can, you know, get get a grant from us and we'll chip in an extra five or six dollars to make it a much higher hourly wage. And once again, are, are people going to take it? I, I don't know. But uh, just the fact that the Federal Reserve has discontinued reporting 
their numbers, but yet the Bureau of Labor Statistics and all these other entities come out with theirs. Eh, yeah, it's it's all sketchy. <laughs> it's funny how the uh, governor is offering this, and uh, most of the problem was created by her, you know, with the lockdowns. <laughs> so that's that's typical for politicians, not only in Michigan, but everywhere around the world. <laughs> and here as well, uh, there's a big chain of pubs and restaurants called Weather Spoons, mm -hmm. and, and the guy who uh, runs and owns it, he was a, a, a big supporter of Brexit, <laughs> of leaving the EU, but yeah. now he's asking the government to allow uh, European workers to come and work here again because they can't find the staff. So that's pretty ironic and hypocritical, I, I found. So we're having the same problems here. They're talking... I think we were going to cover this, but we can jump into it. Yeah. In the UK, I saw a headline this uh, week in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ministers said that they're looking at possibly extending furlough. And whenever they come out with these statements, it means that they probably will. Yeah. Uh, furlough is like, uh, yeah, it was extended already from September, uh, October last year to October this year. Yeah. And, and now there's also talk uh, of uh, the cases of this uh, beer uh, disease yeah. <laughs> uh, increasing. So, uh, And I also heard something to the effect that half the people here wouldn't mind continuing to be in lockdown. So I yeah. think they're putting everything together here. Uh, it's not going to help um, the economy here. You know, like you said before we came online, uh, that uh, everything crashed so much that any bounce in employment looks good. It's yeah. like the stock market. If we drop from 10,000 to 1,000, you know, and then it rises 1,000 points, people say, oh, the stock market just doubled, but it's still <laughs> way below the all-time high. And that's what's happening to the economy and the jobs. A and you can bet the government and the mainstream media and the economists, they're going to jump on that to make it look great because they yeah. need to keep the Ponzi scheme going. They yeah. need to keep... Uh, people uh, spending and borrowing, so they have to make them think that everything is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and as I was mentioning as well, so if there's hint at extending the emergency measures in your neck of the woods, and of course the narrative is that you know cases, cases, cases. That's something we're going to hear for quite some time now, I believe. And so over here in the U.S., I would imagine that there will be something thrown at us. You know, you mentioned it. Poss possibly the cyber attack stuff will be used to somehow to to further the government's, you know, rule over the people. But then also I know here in Sept I think September, uh, the emergency measures or the extension opportunities that they provided for the public here is set to expire. But we've already had more than I think 14 or so, more than 14 states have already dialed back or canceled the federal assistance programs. And so heading into the fall, one of my concerns is that, you know, when flu season hits, then we'll see what type of environment we're in then and what type of numbers we'll have. Because I, I believe, as I mentioned before, there's no disconnecting the rollout of these things that are putting in people's bodies with the possible expectations of more illness and sickness in the days ahead. So I think that they definitely uh, they're trying to get as many shots into the arm before Biden's July 4th uh, Independence Day for whatever reason. So, we'll yeah, see. they're really pushing the, you know, that. That's jab a, yeah. here, jab here too. It's a, full participation. They're pushing full participation. Is what yeah, I mean. <laughs> it's crazy. Here they're uh, trying to tell us, uh, you know, there's new uh, variants. Mm -hmm. The we had the India variant. Now there's a Nepal variant. I guess next is Mongolia. If you keep going north <laughs> in that neck of the woods, but the other thing they've done here is that uh, we have uh, this travel system. So mm -hmm. if uh, a country is in the red list, you can't really go there. And then mm -hmm. there's the amber list. Uh, you can go there, but when you come back, you have to quarantine, mm -hmm. I think, 10 days or isolate because quarantine is really, uh, for, uh, I think, 40 days technically. Yeah. But uh, And then you had a few countries, and especially Portugal, which is uh, – an pretty popular here uh that was on the green list and now they've put it back on the amber so we basically can't really go abroad this mm -hmm. year anymore in the summer and yeah. i think that's quite significant they want to keep people from traveling and uh the only reason i can think 
they want to do that is that there could be some big crisis. Uh, there is a feeling, I think, that in Europe and in the UK, people are buying more into this crisis. Yeah. While in the states, like you said, 14 states, you know, they they're back to normal. They want to live their lives, and I don't think the globalists like that. Yeah. And that's why I I think this cyber situation could be a, mm -hmm. a next uh, a next uh, <laughs> crisis, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah there's uh, Klaus Schwab has spoken about that since last year that it could make the uh, crisis that we're in we've been in since like last year look like a picnic. Yeah, yeah. And so to speak, you can ask one thing, as I mentioned, you can't disconnect, you know, the financial monetary realm from this whole health situation because it's interconnected. And so a part of those states that have rolled back the federal unemployment, those are, you know, heavy Republican states that just don't believe and participate in none of this. They've also banned the passport situations as well. And so those states are literally disrupting things to where you know, when, when that whole cyber situation happened this week, I was trying to throw out scenarios of what could be next. We had the gas pipeline. We had the food situation. And so the question is, what's next? And so speaking of which, we can actually jump into that as well uh, as to what could be next and what is already planned to take place. But I think uh, the plan B, if things seem to be out of control, as if they're not able to control the narrative, then you go to the next best thing, which I think the cyber situation will be it. So yeah. Um, the next crisis that I think the World Economic Forum even call it now a cyber pandemic. And they said it could spread a lot quicker than uh, yeah. the coronavirus. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think these cri these uh, these cri these uh, cyber attacks, we had the colonial attack uh, a few like a month or so ago. I don't remember yeah. exactly. And that that disrupted the. Uh, gas supplies and gasoline supplies on the eastern seaboard. Yeah, uh, but that's going. That's finished. You know, no one's talking about that. And you might say, "Oh, then it's not a problem." But I think the the reason they do these uh, or these happen is so that it's in people's uh, mm -hmm. back of people's mind when the real big crisis happens. Yeah. They they will uh, actually say, "Oh yeah, that happened last month or a few months ago." And now yeah. this uh, this JBS, this meat uh, packing company, um, that's the I, I think uh, they're connected as well to this, and, yeah. and apparently they're big partners with the uh, World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I I, I t ranted about the other day on my side was that uh, I would imagine all these big corporations that our publicly traded companies have global footprints. They have to comply with the World Economic Forum because they're usually supplying the world's goods, good services or, or employment or something. And I actually highlighted on the World Economic Forum page that you know, in their platform section, every area of our lives, they have a category that starts off with restructuring the future in energy, restructuring the future in consumption. Refu I'm thinking like, so I went through all of those little names there and I'd imagine a lot of these cyber events will will take place in, with entities that are associated with just because on April 28th, JBS partnered with the World Economic Forum. So it's no coincidence yeah. that a month later, something happens, you know. And all these big corporations and the leaders of these corporations and also leaders of central banks and IMF, World Bank, uh, leaders of uh, big media companies, they meet. Uh, well, they used to meet every year up until 2019 in Davos. You know, that was a big, uh, the Davos summit, you know, billionaires meeting, all, all the leaders, politicians. So all these people are, they're working together. It, yeah. It's just us, the small people and the small mom and pop businesses that have been decimated yeah. <laughs> by this crisis yeah. uh, that, key, that, that are in the dark. And uh, the frustrating uh, thing is that, when you try to tell people about this, uh, they 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 uh, call you a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> uh, even though everything that's been happening, you know, we were trying to warn people. Even last year, I told people when this crisis started that it was going to be uh, similar to the uh, oil crisis. Uh, of the 70s, which Lindsay Williams said was going to be the en set, wrote a book and said it was the energy non crisis. Yeah. Uh, yes, oil prices went up, 
but it was not just the Arabs that uh, cut the supply. Uh, the uh, pipelines from the west coast of the U.S. Mm -hmm. were told to turn off the oil that was going east by the U.S. government. And uh, so um, <laughs> <laughs> not surprising whatsoever that things don't make sense. So as you were speaking, just out of curiosity, uh, I had the idea of typing in partners with the World Economic Forum. And <laughs> here is a list from A all the way probably to Z. And you have all these entities in here, and so yeah, I can I can tell you uh, if you scroll up uh, on the A again. Okay, let me see here. A again. I mean, uh, A A B B. Uh, I mean, they used to be one of my clients when I worked in the city. Big uh -huh. engineer, uh, Isaiah Brown Bavari, big Swiss engineering company, A I G, mm. bailed out by the U.S. taxpayer in two thousand and eight. Allianz, one of the biggest financial companies in the world. Yeah, they're all there. Uh, AstraZeneca. Alibaba, AstraZeneca. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, know, let's see. Throw, throw yeah. out your favorite company, throw out a product. You I use, bet you JP Morgan is in there under J, maybe. JP Morgan. Uh, let me see here. Uh, JP oh. Morgan Chase. Oh, there you go. Johnson. Oh, yeah. surprising. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so for people to and for people tuning in, here's a little here's a little opportunity for you guys. Throw out a company, throw out a product or throw out something that you like. I'll see if they're in here. Because if they are partner with them, then they obviously have to abide by and go according to the. Yeah. The, uh, I, I don't. I don't think uh, Mike and Mario are under M. <laughs> <laughs> Manpower Group, uh, Mastercard, Morgan Stanley. So all the globally systemically yeah. important banks, of course, are here. Microsoft are here. Mitsubishi. Yeah. So uh, let me see. And this is once again, I didn't think about this till now. So Mario, I appreciate you for you know sparking this idea here because this is we can get a chance to see. I, so the next question will be. When this cyber attack that takes place, so let's actually let me go to there. So this cyber well, this is supposed time, to be, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Supposed no, no, go ahead. So, a, I was, so I was gonna say it's supposed to be, uh, yeah, supposed to be an exercise that the World Economic Forum is uh, uh, organizing on the 9th of July, and they're using all these partners to yeah. participate. But you, you take, you talk about this now. No, so want. yeah, so uh, these are just some things I highlighted here. That uh, you, you brought to my attention uh, or refreshing my memory on, uh, but July 9th is the time where they're going to have, and you you brought to my attention that you know a, 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 an event occur in real time, corporate ecosystem in real time, and so the question we were trying to throw out there is like, what does that look like in real time? Like, how can an exercise take place in real time when we're told to expect a cyber attack like we've never seen before, and then how will that impact? The internet, you know, life in general, because I can Internet Co Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is basically the World Wide Web, they're a part of it. So there's a lot of interesting things starting to connect right now that's going to cause yeah. a lot of issues yeah. very soon. I think they, they, I mean, if this happens and hopefully it doesn't, yeah. they would probably turn everything off and uh, we'd be uh, without. <laughs> and the economy would come to a halt and they would disrupt all the supply chains as well. You know, and Amazon is the biggest company now on the Internet. Uh, and uh, the thing that is a little bit concerning is that uh, during 9-11, they were having a drill, mm -hmm. <laughs> conducting a drill the day of 9-11 for something exactly like 9-11. 7-7 yeah. in London uh, they were conducting a drill for the same exact event on the same day. Yeah. So um, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it is a possibility, or it could happen a few months after Polygon, uh, just like uh, Event 201 uh, yeah. preceded uh, the real cri the crisis last year by a couple of months. Right, right. And that's one of the things where even like, you know, as you mentioned, Lindsay, Winston, Lindsay Williams earlier, like me watching some of his videos, he always mentioned that it's like, you know, the elite's code that they have to give signs. They can't just do anything without, you know, informing the people just because they have, you know, even though they're evil, they still have standards, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, they feel bad if they don't warn us. Yeah, for real. So for those tuning in, hit that thumbs up button, show your support for the channel, throw out some questions or some thoughts. We got a couple more topics to touch on, but want to make sure you guys are able to participate. So feel free to chime in when you see fit. So I see a lot of people re referring to the 9-11 event and talk about real time exercise and stuff like that. So it's amazing how people who are in the alternative media realm still question that event because they don't believe in it. 
to then able to connect this current event 20 years later and say, hey, like, you know, how come nobody else is able to see this? Like, I remember from for years sharing videos that are no longer listed on YouTube about all the things that, you know, you just happen to have. You have to question these things, but they get taken down. You get silenced. And just yeah. this past week, I got my first medical misinformation strike for talking about this event. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, wow, like they're really, you know, trying to make sure that you don't, you know, contradict what they want people to believe. And, you know, it seems to work. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I guess that event 20 years ago coming in September uh, is in the it's kind of uh, been put in the back burner mm -hmm. <laughs> because, uh, so, you know, there's something uh, an even of uh, pretty big crisis now uh, that we've had since yeah. last year. So, yeah. And uh, like you said, the, the censoring is really bad. I mean, and uh, they use the term conspiracy theory, yeah, uh, of course, to try to discredit people. Yeah. So somebody in the chat, you know, asked uh, us to look up uh, Olympus. And so under Open oh, society, so that that's uh, George Soros, isn't it? Open Society Foundation. Uh, let's take a look at it real quick. Yeah, I think it is. So it goes back to, <laughs> so this is a no, okay. So I'll say it goes back yeah. to headquartered in the USA. View the, view the site here. Open Society Foundations org. Man, look who we who we are. The Open Society Foundation works to build vibrant, inclusive democracies. They they build democracies. Well, okay. uh, go on, uh, who we are, and uh, who we are. Uh, yeah, okay. I, it's a George Soros thing. Yeah, you see George Ooh. Soros. There you go. Founded by George Soros. So yeah, so man, are the world's <laughs> largest private funder. Of independent groups working <laughs> so here's the thing so just reading this little, little i, I think are. it should be called the closed society foundation <laughs> yeah or, or i mean you or you probably <laughs> can become a member like you know if you're a millionaire billionaire but just look at this are the world's largest private funder private funder of independent groups working for justice democratic governance and human rights so i'm thinking about what organizations could it be funded hmm, black lives matter uh antifa any other organizations because i assume all, all the uh, all the UK color as well. Huh. All the color revolutions that we've seen abroad, yeah, trying to disrupt governments abroad, like in the Ukraine, they mm. they finance that as well. Yeah. Um, oh, or to give a list of them. They, yeah, they have a list of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, starting to build more. So this is yeah, uh, Central way. Europe. You know that that's why Iron like Curtain, uh, yeah, China, yeah, former yeah. Soviet open doors. So yeah, and so just the fact that they can. This is an organization web page right out in front of our face. Nobody believed this is being something beneficial for humanity they're literally destabilizing governments in their own interest but they're able to tell you where the funds go like so they yeah. got 140 million towards democratic practice what is what is democratic practice you might know what that is well and the other thing as well people forget especially here in the uk george soros he's not really uh altruistic or looking after our interest mm -hmm. because he he broke uh helped break the bank of england and uh crashed the british pounds mm -hmm. in 1992 and that led to a huge recession yeah. you know he, this is a guy who he he you know his way of investing and trading uh is through chaos yeah. so uh you know he will make uh, billions uh, fr from this yeah and it's a family oh, business <laughs> yeah of course yeah he's getting on a bit george soros so he's got a Pass, so pass, pass. a uh, in 1979 is when it started. It says since then he's given over 32 billion. He's given 32 billion to the fund, which work in over 120 countries around the world. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm always uh, suspicious of all these philanthropic tax-free foundations. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I don't trust none of them. And then I, I would imagine a lot of these organizations, their funding and their you know, a lot of their uh, financial activities probably go back to the Panama Papers and all those trusts oh, yeah. down in the islands and stuff like that. And those, so, that $32 billion as well, uh, yeah, it goes through his open society thing, but it could come from donors as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the Clinton uh, global initiative or foundation yeah. uh, they give billions of dollars but they get those billions from uh you know the big corporations who are all on this list that you yeah. have there Procter so, and gamble so yeah. for those that are tuning in we're looking at the world economic forums partners and we're trying to connect the dots as to how this next cyber event might somehow some way play into some of these actors here and of course, all the major, all the 
major publicly funded or publicly traded companies, I'm sure, are on here. And by them signing up, they are probably giving some promises of some things that they can benefit from. Oh, yeah. benefit from They're going to be benefit from it. The, you know, the big corporations have benefited from what's happened in the last 16 months or so because mm -hmm. they're, they're close to the Federal Reserve and central banking uh, monetary spigot. Yeah. The people who are not going to benefit are the people who are not on that list. Small right. businesses, uh, mom and pop businesses. And um, mm. so yeah, we got uh, Saudi Aramco on here. Yeah. SP Global, Siemens, SK Group. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's 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 uh, you have to. Yeah. The things you had Coca Cola's on here so we can go through this forever. But this is interesting. Yeah. UBS. So all the all the major banks are on here. And so I, I'm, I know. So as a cyber event probably plays out, God forbid it does. But if it, if it, if it happens, I wonder. And I was actually thinking about doing a video off to, uh, off the possibilities of the bank bail-ins because that's still on the table. I would imagine the banking sector has taken severe losses, and so mm -hmm. they've been over overly plastered with you know QE and all the deposits that have been put into the system with all these checks or whatnot. But I wonder what's the plans for the two big to fail banks as they roll out CBDCs? How will they interconnect that? I think is going to be something we'll to pay attention to. Uh, yeah, I think what could happen is that if there is a cyber event, uh, they uh, turn everything off. And then maybe a, a week or two later, everything comes back online. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of having uh, dollars in your bank account, you've got the Fed coin. I've got the mm -hmm. uh, Bank of England coin. And they restructured everything. And they've, uh, you know, you might have uh, 10,000 Fed coins, uh, but it might not be worth uh, the ten thousand dollars you had before the crisis. I, I don't know, but yeah. uh, whenever there's a big crisis like that, and they, uh, how can I say, uh, turn things off or freeze things, mm -hmm. you can bet that there's going to be shenanigans going on. A little bit like probably there was uh, after that event twenty years ago. They shut the stock market down, I think, for a week or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on and uh, they they might also wipe out a lot of things, you know, like emails that people don't want people to see. Mm. Yeah. So so to, I'm thinking <laughs> like I know as of now in the U.S. So here's a little thought I would share. Somebody mentioned that I want to inform everyone here to watch a documentary called Europa, The Last Battle. It really shines light as to what's going on now. So for those that are interested, I haven't seen it, but, you know, I'll, I'll check it out. So uh, thanks for sharing that. But here here, Amazon. It has the biggest server network that I'm aware of, and they partner with the government and all, you know, every company for some reason hosts their stuff through the servers at Amazon. And so I, I would assume that Amazon would be immune from that. Like they want to either be able to retain their information because do you see the governments around the world? You know, you know, and Alibaba also has a nice little network in the eastern yeah. region. So I would assume that they're not going to completely shut everything off because it's designed uh, to confused to retail investor slash you know everyday citizen because it's going to impact government systems as well unless they got you know version 2.0 or something i i think they uh you know they might not uh erase a lot of amazon stuff but i, I think if they really want to scare people and make it uh a crisis they will turn everything off amazon everything included it's going to be a total you know wipe out Mm -hmm. uh, wipe out so to speak yeah that that's what i see because you can't let a, a few people be exempt from right. it because then you you can people are going to be suspicious right now he, he, so here just you know this is like you know left far left field <laughs> yet at this current moment anything's within the realm of possibility when you're looking at a globally structured and, and strategically planned event and so what's the likelihood of possibility that you know some part of the plans of the cyber attack happens to be about something here. Like if they can't stop it, they can shut off the systems that influence these networks here. What, what do you think about yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that if you shut the internet down for a week or two, uh -huh. uh, I don't think uh, it will be the end of those, but yeah. it, it, you will just won't be able to transact in them yeah. for a week or two. Uh, <laughs> that That's all, but it doesn't mean to say that it's, it's over. Yeah. So I uh, so while we're moving, we've had a chance to jump around a little bit. Let's uh, let's touch on the. Uh, let me actually pull this up here. 
let's touch on this article here <laughs> <laughs> about uh, price inflation in, in the automotive realm. What do you think? What, what's your <laughs> you know, actually the uh, article says that uh, a used cars, the way you read that, it looks uh -huh. like used, used cars are causing inflation because it says kind of crazy <laughs> how booming U.S. used cars market is driving inflation. Yeah. And the reason I sent you that so we can talk about it is that it just shows you how they detract attention from the real culprit, mm -hmm. which is the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. and the Treasury because they're pumping the inflation into the system. Uh, by printing money and uh, by the uh, you know the Fed prints the money, the Treasury borrows it. Mm -hmm. That becomes currency, and that's why prices of used cars are rising. It, it's not used car prices that are creating inflation. That's mm -hmm. what I, I was trying to. Uh, uh, that's the point I'm trying to make yeah. here. Yeah. But unfortunately, uh, even the FT, uh, the mainstream economists, everyone. Uh, they will come out and say car car prices are causing inflation, and, and I'm just trying to warn people not to mm -hmm. fall into that trap because yeah. inflation is a creation of government and central banks. Yeah. Uh, when prices rise, it's the consequence uh, thereof of inflation. Yeah. yeah. So all the good old smoke and mirrors. Look over here while we yeah. you know try to keep yeah. your attention from all, That's all, right. all over here. So here's another article here. Uh, stagflation signals soaring as factory orders tumbled in April. And so th that's one of the things that I've, you know, so like literally like we've had, there's a lot of people in the community over here that are really not necessarily diehard deflationary, the deflationaryist, you know, type of people, but just, they just try to connect the dots based upon a lot of commentary that's out here. And I'm sure, are, are you familiar with uh, Steve Van Meter? Yeah. The Bond King, and so like listening to him yeah. and his, listen to his yeah. thesis, he makes he makes sense, you know, based upon the way he's. You know, I, I thought uh, I thought Bill Gross was the original Bond Bond King, but uh, okay, yeah. So yeah, I, I think uh, self Steve Van Meter is self proclaimed. Self yeah. Well, uh, I think what he means about the thing is uh, a matter of semantics. Inflation mm -hmm. is the creation of money and credit out of thin air mm -hmm. that could could lead to rising prices of all different kinds of things. Right. You could have inflation and have some prices dropping, uh, but deflation is actually the technically uh, is the opposite of inflation. It, it's the destruction of money and credit mm -hmm. that could result in falling prices of anything. And, and if you look at the uh, money supply and the credit mm -hmm. uh, boom, of yeah. the, you know, for the last I don't know how long, at least since '08 since they had to save the system, mm -hmm. it, it's like that. So yeah. you can't call that deflation. Right. I, I think what he means is that uh, by keeping interest rates low, companies are able to borrow more and, and become more efficient and cut prices and produce more things, and that leads to lower prices. But um, the currency itself, you know, if he can come out and tell me that things are a lot cheaper nowadays, that with twenty dollars he could he can buy a lot more than he could ten years ago, then I'll believe him. But twenty dollars nowadays, uh, or twenty pounds, will buy very little compared yeah. to ten or twenty years ago, and that for me is the consequence of inflation. Your currency yeah. goes down in value, and when that happens, prices go up because everything is priced in your currency. So if that currency loses value, that means things will be more expensive. Yeah. So based upon those, those different, those, uh, you know, deflationary, inflationary, uh, stay for stagflation in the middle, where would you, so on your meter, on the Mario meter, we are already experiencing extreme, you know, relatively, we're on, where would we be at? Well, inflation, this, we've, inflation, we've already, we've, in my, uh, version of the world we've mm -hmm. already we're, we've been having inflation since 1971 uh, because right. uh, there's no anchor to the monetary right. system money's been created out of thin air uh what we're seeing now is uh the inflation flow into sectors that the powers that be don't like it to flow mm -hmm. into which is uh the sector that affects the majority of the public the most which is consumer goods you know, which is rentals, second secondhand cars. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and, and I would argue tuition. I I would argue that's already been happening, but they've been covering it up through the statistics. But now even the statistics can't cover it up anymore. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and before that, a lot of the inflation uh, and still to this day is flowing into uh, paper assets like stocks and bonds. Uh, so that that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Purely monetary phenomenon uh, inflation. Right. Monetary yeah. quasi. So watch this. So do you think that there's a, a deliberate attempt by the World Economic Forum and all their partnerships when it comes to the actual producers of goods, services, JBS, meat producing, all those companies out there that are part of their plan that they are supposed to intentionally hold back services or goods? Or, or event or you know how these cyber attack events to cause a disruption of supply to where things aren't shipped out as much to also create panic and fear to promote more of the inflation narrative because that's what they choose like because inflation as you mentioned has been there all along but yeah. yet now last couple of months it is now a preferred mainstream topic is that by choice or do you think they're literally doing it because that's what they want us to focus on now well i, I think there's a few things you know uh, a lot of these partners uh, is very compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. So people don't really look at the bigger picture like we do. And they just go, you know, they will do an exercise, cyber exercise. They don't know the bigger picture. As for inflation, yes, they're going to use the last year's crisis and the next crisis. Uh, and they, they're going to say that's why prices went up. They're not yeah. going to say prices have gone up because we've had 50 years of uh real inflation <laughs> you know it's like in the 70s uh, and i felt fell into that trap you know in the 80s and 90s uh, we always said uh, oh the inflation in the 70s was caused by high oil prices mm -hmm. but then when i started learning about uh, the monetary system the gold standard uh, i realized that the inflation in the 70s or the rising prices was created by the inflation of the 60s you know the 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 printing of money uh, and credit out of thin air mm -hmm. uh, which led of course to nixon closing the gold window because they're running out of gold because they they printed too many uh, dollars that was not backed by gold yeah. but they used the uh, opec embargo and the oil crisis as a scapegoat and they and the arabs you know it's there it's an easy target blame blame those camel jockeys over in saudi arabia <laughs> <laughs> you know and this time blame uh blame covid and blame the russians for the cyber attack for inflation yeah, yeah. speaking of which <laughs> uh, you know one of the words you mentioned there, I, I i don't know if that's uh insulting to say the camel thing but uh <laughs> I mean, no, it, you know, it, it's, it's real talk. You know, we're, we're, I remember that. Uh, I remember that term. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, speak, because one thing you mentioned, you know, in, in your commentary there is that the whole idea of gold and closing a gold window. So it looks like the gold window was opened involuntarily by a lot of nations. And in particular, you know, heading into this next subject matter here, it looks like Russia has officially opened up the gold window for one of their, <laughs> their wealth fund there. And so they're dumping dollars. So the de-dollarization is probably close to the end because China, Russia, everybody who realized the importance of gold have already repatriated and brought back their gold as much as they can, at least. So this article here I, I thought was interesting because Russia's to eliminate U.S. dollar from sovereign wealth fund this month. So is this anything to do with the Basel III situation? And it the fact could that be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, if I think it was in 2019, I think it was. Uh, at the time, the governor of the Bank of England, uh, Mark Carney, said that the dollar was, uh, you know, the dollar status was like precarious as a yeah. reserve currency. And then later in 2019, Putin said that the dollar would collapse very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, and this makes me think that, uh, you know, it, it's a little bit extreme. Uh, this is the Russian sovereign wealth fund. They mm -hmm. invest for like a public pensions, I think, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, th they're not just getting rid of uh, treasuries. They're getting rid of, you know, their holdings of uh, Microsoft or anything that's denominated in dollars. And it seems extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, why would they do that? Well, it could be political uh, mm -hmm. and it could be also because they expect the dollar maybe to drop. Yeah. And then uh, and then, you know, after the dollar drops, then they will come in and buy the American investments because they've held on to the gold. Yeah. So. Um, so what did that? So uh, several things that came to mind when I first saw this is that, you know, 
if the Russians and other nations are abandoning dollar denominated assets and in particular the dollar itself, because they, and they, one of the articles, another article mentioned that uh, because they're, they're concerned of ultimately that, you know, the political, political, politicalization of the financial markets with the dollar, just the fact that they've mm. used the dollar, the dollar has become a weapon to try to prop everything yeah. up. And it's, or the world uh, you know, also the sanctions that they, uh, and impose the on Russia. Very true. So with all those factors there, the question I would assume that they're asking themselves as a nation is like, you know, the, the dollar is no longer a part of our future anyway, because of all the currency swaps, the partnerships. We have China beneath us that we, we've, you know, we've solidified some things. We're good to go. And I always mentioned in the past that at some point when the those powers are not side because of the amount of gold they've accumulated, that's unknown still the moment they're ready to flip this switch on. That's when I think, you know, everything will be lost as far as the actual confidence in U.S. reserve status of the, of the currency. So I think that's this decade. Me, me personally, Mario, what do, what do you think? You think that's this decade or what? Uh, or, or well, I don't know how it's it's on the way. And I think, you know, uh, it's interesting that this has come out just a few weeks, a week or so uh -huh. after uh, Biden said he wanted to spend six trillion, you know, mm -hmm. in the next. Uh, so they're seeing this, you know, why do we want to hold uh, a currency that's been created like mm -hmm. at a really a rate of knots, <laughs> you know, right. six trillion. Uh, right. It, I it, think it's, it's got to do with that as well. <laughs> they they can see the writing on the wall. Yeah. And the fact that there, and I think even Jerome Powell, I think it was mentioned that there was no concern that, you know, he's asking about their balance sheet. He is like, you know, oh, we're, we're nowhere near. We're not. We're nowhere near concerned with, you know, the, the what we what we have on our balance sheet because we're 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 still. It was a. He gave a very small percentage of <laughs> what's still available, and I'm thinking like, well, damn, but they plan on using the full extent of their <laughs> capabilities, and what the heck will a dollar look like for real? So that right there is a threat, and it's coming from the central bank itself. So then encouraging the government to come together and to to spend like there's no amount that uh, is too small to help bring back the economy. So, but we, we have a question in the super chat. Then we'll get ready to dial back as well. Um, uh, this is from Hemming Distance. It says, isn't it a coincidence that the World Economic Forum promotes eating insects in the future because of CO2 and go green? And now the biggest meat producers got hit. <laughs> uh, very timely. <laughs> yeah, but it's weird though, because these producers, uh, JBS is a partner with the World Economic mm -hmm. Forum. So at the same time, you know, maybe uh, they're going to start producing uh, uh, meat that's just insect or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Now, so speaking of which, for those that are just tuning in, we went through the World Economic Forum, World Economic Forum partnerships, and now that I just think about it, the, the JBS is not on here because this is probably outdated, perhaps because they yeah, they, they joined April if, 28th. Because if you Google uh, World Economic Forum and JBS, they are partners. I have yeah. looked on their website. So yeah, this so, is probably, like you said, they've become uh, partners uh, only a, a couple of months ago or six weeks. Yeah. So they haven't updated it. So I, would, I wonder, and we will find out because we'll stay on top of this, but I wonder what other companies and corporations are probably late to the party because of the fear of the whole cyber event that could be coming in the future. So we will see. But uh, Mario, what do you think, man? It's about time to dial back or what? Yeah. All right. So we did have a call, but my my phone line on, on my computer is acting up. So <laughs> I won't be able to take any today, but I'll try to get that fixed for next week. But um, some parting words of wisdom, Mario. Want to leave us with anything? Um, <laughs> wisdom. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, things are getting really uh, crazy. And yeah. Um, yeah, I think people need to try to stay calm mm -hmm. and not uh, and just try to focus on yourself, your family, the community uh, that you live in. Yeah, because you know they're they're going to try to scare people. Uh, I think, unfortunately, with the cyber, they're really building it up to something. And um, yeah, maybe uh, think about in the U.S. and here in the U.K. as well as having. Uh, some extra food and stuff. I'm. I don't mean having you know years of food or, but having a little bit extra because you might not be able to uh, go to the shop for a week or two if there is this cyber event. 
Yeah. And so as you're speaking, I decided to just take this one call. Let's see if we can get a, a call real quick. And then we'll dial back officially. So hello, Carlos. Where are you calling from? Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Miles Miles from NY. Miles Miles from NY. How you doing, my friend? What's on your mind? Well, good. I just had a question for the dynamic duo uh, today, man. It's a real, <laughs> well, it may be an easy question for y'all, but I'm just wondering what would happen to the strength of the dollar if the U.S. Uh, uh, removed its sanctions globally? Like, would that increase the strength of the dollar and confidence and things like that? I'm just wondering because I heard something along the lines of a lecture that I was listening to yesterday about what the feds could do and what the U.S. could do to strengthen the dollar as like a last resort mm -hmm. to keep it going longer. And I was wondering what would happen if they started uh, removing the sanctions? Would other countries come back to the table and would it restore confidence? Anyway, man, I appreciate all you guys' work. You know, I'm there for y'all. Hey, look, keep doing the good work, guys. We really appreciate it. And the message is reaching people. Appreciate yeah. you. Thank you, my friend, for calling in. Uh, man, so I got some thoughts. Go ahead, Mario. We got some thoughts on that? Yeah, my thought is that damned if they do, damned if they don't, you know, yeah. because the reason they use sanctions now is to try to keep the dollar from, uh, you know, disappearing. Mm -hmm. But if they uh, cancel all the, the sanctions, then the countries that they've sanctioned – they're they're gonna go and become independent they're gonna go and try to uh form their own blocks and that's gonna hurt the dollar so yeah it, it, i don't think it matters because uh the the thing that will strengthen the dollar is if the fed raises interest rates to five six seven or ten percent mm -hmm. if the u.s strategy starts running surpluses and paying off the debt then the mm -hmm. dollar will go up but for them to do that it would destroy the economy so i, I don't think there's a way to strengthen the dollar even if they, uh, you know, do away with the sanctions, it's yeah. too late. Now, looking through this list of countries here, there's, you know, we all know that we all know the nations and the problems they've had with them before. And and to my knowledge, all these nations here, their central banks are not all lock and step with the uh, the globalist agenda. So that's a part of the sanctions list. But how about the idea that if the U.S. for some reason decided to which it wouldn't happen, but if they were to open up the gold window and revalue the dollar in gold compared to let it go to 50,000 or whatever, you know, you know, people say that it should be and made it redeemable for gold. And if we actually had gold and Fort Knox steel, do you think that would be enough to show the show efforts to the world that, Hey, we're going to try to get together, you know, don't run completely. You know, you can redeem them if you want, or or or, or, or it's literally still to yeah. that way because people gonna want their gold regardless. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think for the world to go back on a gold uh, standard, mm -hmm. and uh, you can open the window, but it has to be you know the promise of paying a fixed amount. It never changes, you see. And yeah. and uh, if you come under pressure, you have to raise or cut rates, you know, to keep it there. But mm -hmm. I, I think the U.S. needs to. It can't just be a, a unilateral decision. It yeah. will be, you know, the U.S., Europe, China, maybe Russia sitting together and, you know, working out a new system. So yeah. Yeah. Well, hey. Um yeah, good thoughts, man. I appreciate the question there as well. Just you know, give us more you know food to chomp on. But in the meantime, get your weight up, people. Take advantage of the manipulation because that Basel three situation could be the real deal, or it could be a pump fake. We'll see. But in the meantime, don't wait. So, uh, regardless of the premiums, in my opinion, it's probably as cheap as it's going to ever be right now. So, uh, but anyway, but that being the case, everybody enjoy your weekend. Mario is always great to connect with you, my friend. Manico 64 on YouTube. Go check them out. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. It's good to see everybody here. You know, they they know they know what you bring in every day, Mario. And Thanks, so uh, definitely connect with them. And uh, if you're watching this after the fact, rethinkingadollar.com is where you can find me as well. So anyway, people, be blessed, be safe. We'll see you guys later. Peace.